Geothermal energy is next on the line. Geothermal energy is the heat extracted from the interior of the earth and is used to generate electricity. For example, in the volcanic regions, there is plenty of um, geothermal energy available. Uh, do we have the audio available now? Geothermal energy gives us a steady supply of electrical power with minimal environmental impact. Here is the basic process. Water in underground reservoirs is heated to high temperatures by magma. Production wells drilled up to 10,000 feet below the Earth's surface tap into this hot fluid. Under its own pressure, the fluid flows through these wells toward the surface. As it travels, the pressure lessens, causing a small amount to become steam. Together, the hot fluid and steam move through a surface pipeline to a wellhead separator where the pressure is reduced. Here, most of the fluid vaporizes and flashes into high pressure steam. Any fluid not flashed into steam moves to a standard pressure crystallizer to produce standard pressure steam. Remaining fluid is then flashed at a lower pressure to create low pressure steam. All steam created in the plant is sent to a turbine on site. The force of the steam spins the turbine's blades, which turns a shaft connected to an electrical generator. An electrical charge is created and directed to a transformer, where the voltage is increased and sent down power lines. Any fluids not flashed into steam return to the underground reservoir, where, in time, they will be reheated and reused. Geothermal energy, a simple, clean, and renewable energy source. Geothermal energy is readily available, and there is a major development in Nevis. Geothermal energy is also available in Dominica, in St. Lucia, obviously Montserrat. And it is our understanding that Seba, in actual fact, may have more um, geothermal energy than even St. Kitts. Hydroelectricity is the next area we can look at. And here again, hydroelectricity is available from Suriname and Guyana. Hydroenergy is the mechanical force of falling water which generates electricity. And we have here two photographs, one by day and one by night, of the Soralco Dam at Afubaca in Suriname. We'll just have another clip on the question of hydro in terms of the explanation. One hundred and seventy thousand cubic meters of water flow past here every minute at almost sixty kilometers per hour. That's enough water to fill about a hundred thousand Olympic swimming pools every day. Standing here, you can actually feel the power of the water. Harnessing that power is what hydroelectric stations have been designed to do for over a hundred years in Ontario. In essence, they are factories that convert the energy of falling water into the flow of electrons, or what is commonly called electricity. The electricity that powers the province. Most hydroelectric stations use either water diverted around the natural drop of a river, such as a waterfall or rapids, or a dam is built across a river to raise the water level and provide the drop needed to create a driving force. Water at the higher level is collected in the forebay. It flows through the plant intake into a pipe called a penstock, which carries it down to a turbine water wheel at the lower water level. The water pressure increases as it flows down the penstock. It is this pressure and flow that drives the turbine that is connected to the generator. Inside the generator is the rotor that is spun by the turbine. Large electromagnets are attached to the rotor located within coils of copper wire called a stator. 
As the generator rotor spins the magnets, a flow of electrons is created in the coils of the stator. This produces electricity that can be stepped up in voltage through the station transformers and sent across transmission lines. The falling water, having served its purpose, exits the generating station to the tail race, where it rejoins the mainstream of the river to continue the cycle of creating clean, renewable energy for Ontario. In 2001, the total installed capacity of hydroelectricity in Guyana stood at 226 megawatts. The full potential of this resource is 7,000 megawatts. Hydroelectricity requires large areas of land mass. In fact, the, the dam which feeds the the, 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 the dam which is fed in Suriname um, occupies an area some four times the size of Barbados. That gives you some idea of the space that is required. Therefore, Suriname as well as Guyana are ideally positioned to generate the hydroelectricity which we need for the region. The next area we look at is biomass and of course based on the agricultural waste, biomass is readily available and is a good feedstock that can be used anytime and within the various seasons, but there's always enough biomass available, whether it's from the harvesting of canes, uh, corn husks, rice husks, um, when we're trimming trees, but there's always enough biomass available. So, in essence, what I'm saying is that there is enough renewable energy across the Caribbean spread among our islands that when mixed with the, judiciously, with the fossil fuels which are available in Trinidad and Tobago, some in Barbados, some in Suriname, that we actually have all the energy we need for this chain of islands we call the Caribbean. The challenge which we face is to utilize the resources we have in an environmentally proper way or in an environmentally appropriate way and at the same time find a vehicle to transform the way we use energy. So essentially if we could use the resources which are available in Guyana, the hydro, as well as expand those facilities between Guyana and Suriname. If we brought the facility from Nevis and Seba downwards, and we could add Dominica, the possibilities are endless for the chain of islands to actually have uh, enough renewable energy. Take, for example, Jamaica with a population 10 times the size of Barbados having an opportunity to replicate what has happened in Barbados, would have some 500,000 solar water heaters installed. This year would save 1,850,000 barrels of oil and $20 million US in consumer savings and 21 million, sorry, 210,000 tons of carbon emission. Trinidad, with half the population of Jamaica, would have half those savings at full potential, Madam Minister. The opportunity, therefore, I think that this is the part that the Minister spoke about earlier, and it's interesting that we are on the same page. The opportunity to run pipelines to transport energy to the islands. That is, in essence, the biggest opportunity which we have. To link these islands with a mix of renewable and non-renewable resources for our use. And so if we looked at the map of the region, 
we should be able to see that opportunity come within a reasonable straight line, half circle, um, where you can feed energy from Trinidad, energy from Dominica, energy from, from Nevis, from Saba, straight up the line to the Bahamas. In this way, we have a major opportunity to blend uh, two things. We can look at optimizing the use of fossil fuels. We can maximize the use of renewable and arrive at a cost of energy which is affordable across the region. The biggest challenge in the region, of course, is that we need to create sustainable jobs and of course, our major, our major industry in the Caribbean is tourism. That major industry consumes quite a lot of energy. And so we need to look at how we can take our en our, the energy that is available and use it judiciously right through the region and in the critical areas of our industry. That is the biggest opportunity we have. The cost of laying this renewable distribution facility should be foremost in our minds. And of course, the minister has already indicated that it's foremost in her mind. And therefore, my, my, I, most of what I would say from now on would be, would be redundant because the minister has taken care of that part of the equation in terms of the opportunity. There is a financial opportunity for development and there's also the opportunity to develop a stream of jobs in renewable energy which we need. So we can build capacity in the renewable energy area. We can optimize the cost of energy whilst developing the, both the renewable and non-renewable energy sectors. And this is the challenge of our period. We must not, we cannot afford to pass this challenge on to our successors. Within the region, we have the potential to solve this problem and to make it manifestly clear that we have not reneged on our obligation to develop the industries of our region simultaneously, both the renewable and the non-renewable energy industries. And so the challenge of our time, the challenge of our period in which we live is to harness the resources at our disposal and to make them available for now and in the future so that we can optimize our development and therefore move the Caribbean region forward. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you.